uh, here we can we can hear the, about the importance of actually involving the users at a very early stage and seeing if if things actually work. And I think his um, one of the most important elements out of today is to look at what worked for the people we're actually designing these technologies for. Um, the next talk uh, is by uh, Dr. Claudio Di Lorito, and he's going to be talking about the work they did for Praised, which is promoting activity, independence, and stability in early dementia. Uh, Claudio, uh, would you like to uh, share your screen, please? Yes, I'll do that. Thank you. It sh should be all right. You should see it. Yeah. You sh is it, does everybody see it? Just a quick squeak. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Brilliant. So, uh, thank you. Um, so today I'll be talking um, how we try to keep our participants active through tele rehab during the COVID nineteen pandemic. And as he just mentioned, these are some results from the promoting activity, um, independence and stability in early dementia uh, study. So today's session will be divided um, into six parts. So the first thing I'll try to do is give you a little bit of introduction around PRAISED, what it is and what we're trying to do. The second section will be around how the COVID-19 pandemic hit uh, PRAISED as well and the ongoing study and how we try to um, address the challenges. Um, the third part will be specifically about one of the research sites within Praised who have been to deliver the intervention through uh, tele-rehab. Um, the fourth part will be around the case study that we presented, and it's part of this presentation today, around the experience of this specific service of delivering tele-rehab. And finally, I'll try to derive some um, basic implications for future uh, clinical practice and hopefully some ideas for um, the sandpit that we're having today as well. And, and of course, I'll be happy to take your questions, but also your feedback. That would be great. So PRAISED. PRAISED stands for Promoting Activity, Independence and Stability in Early Dementia. This is a program where we're trying to deliver physical activity, um, physical exercises and dual task exercises, uh, as well as functional activities of daily living to people living with dementia. There are some examples of the kind of exercises that we're doing in praise in the link uh, that I put here below. So uh, feel free to explore in your own time. Um, this program is intended to be, and I say intended because obviously with COVID we had some issues, it is intended to be delivered in the participants' homes by a multidisciplinary team uh, made up of physiotherapists, occupational therapists, and rehabilitation support workers, and lasts one year. So that's the involvement of the participant in praise. The therapist, the idea is that they co-develop, so together with participants, but also the family, they will develop um, a tailored program but also a set of final goals based on the participants' needs and aspirations to be achieved at the end of the, of the program. Um, our participants are then asked to follow the program that they've designed oops, um, independently um, in between therapy sessions. Um, the therapy sessions are delivered again by the multidisciplinary team and they are intended to mostly monitor progress if there's been any, but also to make adjustments, because again, this is a, a tailored program of activities. Um, there's a link that I've put down here uh, about Praised, if you want to get more info about the study. And we're running um, a multi-site RCT in which we are evaluating both the clinical and cost effectiveness of Praised. And again, there's a link here. This is the trial um, protocol paper. It's freely available online to get, again, more background info. So in terms of the COVID-19, when in March 2020, um, the UK government implemented measures to slow spread of COVID-19, these had an impact on um, praise, of course. Um, in the first in instance, the lockdown started roughly from end of March and ended in, in August 2020, at least for the vulnerable, most vulnerable people. Um, in this case, people over 70, 
and, and with pre-existing conditions, dementia is, is part of this group, we're required to minimize contact with others, to, to shield, to stay at home, and only get urgent health or social care visits. Um, and praise was not deemed um, uh, um, among this category. So um, we had no other choice but to accept that our therapist could not visit the participants at home anymore for the therapy visits. And we um, immediately converted the visits from uh, in-home visits to uh, remote uh, therapy sessions. Um, so all the participants that at the time of the lockdown, the first lockdown in, in, in the UK, were involved in praise, they were immediately converted to uh, tele-rehab. Tele-rehab essentially was either through the phone for most participants and in some cases through video calling. And video calling is actually the core of my presentation today because that's the, the interesting um, and novelty bit. So one of the five research sites within TEAM um, is um, the Lincolnshire um, team, um, NHS Trust team. Um, this uh, specific research site team was able to deliver um, praise entirely, almost entirely, through a video calling platform um, named QHealth. Um, QHealth is NHS approved, and it's a platform that allowed um, the multidisciplinary therapists and the participants to set up and, held, um, and hold the uh, therapy sessions online through a video conferencing system. Essentially, that's what it is. On the right-hand side, you can see a screenshot of the uh, interface of QHealth. So that's the main page where the participants would go onto. They would be provided with a password, a secure one, and they would uh, both um, um, arrange the therapy session, but also attend the therapy session. So it's all through here. QHealth had two main requirements. One, of course, was access to technology, which, as lots of the speakers today have, have already said, is an issue. Um, uh, so um, basic stuff like an internet connection and a technology device uh, could be a laptop, computer, tablet, any, any kind of digital device. And the second requirement, quite importantly, was being able to download a QHealth application because that was the way in which they could book the appointment and, of course, have the therapy session. Um, so we ran uh, this um, um, these, um, case study um, um, based on the Lincolnshire team experience. The aim of this uh, small study was to gather initial, and I say initial because, again, it's a small study, so it's preliminary evidence on tele-rehabilitation for people living with dementia during COVID-19, maybe to derive some implications as well. The objectives were to identify those participants that QHealth worked for, how it worked, and under which specific conditions, because as everybody said before, you know, every person is different. So the experience of dementia and also tech savviness is so different. Um, and the second objective was to also identify some of the benefits and more, most importantly, the challenges of uh, this system. Um, so we uh, did a qualitative baseline and follow-up case study. We selected all participants receiving praise through uh, QHealth during lockdown. We also involved their caregivers to get perspectives and also all the therapists from the Lincolnship. Lincolnshire Trust. Um, in terms of data collection, we uh, opted for semi-structured interviews um, that I did myself through conference calling and at two time points. So the first was one month into, um, the, into starting using QHealth and the second one was four months after starting using QHealth to get also a sense of progress, whether, you know, the usability and, and the, the, the um, and, and the way that the participants interacted with the therapist changed over time. Um, we analyzed data through deductive thematic analysis because we had clear um, um, objectives as the main themes. So we, we set study objectives um, as the main themes of the analysis. This paper, if, if you're interested in, 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 in reading um, um, about it, um, it's on, uh, in open access online. Uh, so the title is down below. Um, and, and, and feel free to, to get familiarized with it.
but in a nutshell, I'm going to give you some, some, some of the results and findings we had from this experience. So in terms of, of, of who um, Q help work best and in, under which conditions, we found that almost a requirement was for participants to have somebody, um, carer, family member, uh, um, any person really, who could act as a facilitator during the process. So this was in terms of, again, downloading the app, making the connection, sometimes also trying to facilitate communication during the session. So for example, we found that for some exercises, it was good to have a carer, sort of almost translating the instructions from the therapist to the participant. So this was quite key. Um, we also found that a, a, a condition was for the therapists to show both enthusiasm about the new technology and also knowledge. We had some um, the therapists who were less experienced and that had repercussions on the motivation of the participant to engage in, in this technology. Um, and also in, in terms of motivation, it was quite important to have, if possible, a pre-existing good rapport between the participant and the therapist. We found that where that was possible, because remember, some of these participants were initially face-to-face -face and then they were converted. Where the face-to-face -face had happened before, that had good um, um, re repercussions on the uh, benefits of, uh, and also um, engagement in this process. Some of the benefits of QHealth, of course, the uh, sessions were time efficient. So in terms of services, this was a, um, uh, um, lots of money saving and also uh, travel time. So that's something to be considered. Um, somehow we found that when the participant was able to see the therapist through the video, their motivation um, to do the exercises was enhanced. In, in particular, comparing to those who only received su support through the phone, so in other services, that, that was a big difference there. Um, we also found that because the caregivers were more involved in the process, um, somehow these kind of boosted their awareness about dementia and, and the issues that come with dementia, but also uh, boosted their knowledge um, about um, um, the condition somehow, because they were part of that process. Um, and, and also um, a benefit was that, that this um, QHealth really boosted the therapist's creativity to come up with ways in which to, uh, to, to get the full commitment of the participant and the carer. So to think about new ways to actually um, um, do rehabilitation. Of course, we identified some challenges. The, the biggest one was, um, I as I was suggesting before, the user's uh, poor IT skills. Uh, sometimes it was generational thing. Um, of course, in most cases, it was a cognitive impairment issue. Um, so this is really um, something that needs stressing, but I'll discuss about this in the implications. Um, also, there was, we found that there was little infrastructure and support for some users. So for example, it, poor internet connection, um, living alone was a big thing because nobody was there to support them in the process. So this again was a big challenge. And, and also from the, the therapist uh, side of things, they suggested that some activities were very difficult to undertake uh, and when it was not face-to-face. -face. Uh, risk assessment, for example, a progression of participant was very difficult because they were not there to assess and to, to progress them. There was a risk, of course, um, in not being present, but also ter terminating report at the end of the one year involvement was difficult because sometimes um, on a face-to-face -face basis, it, it's much more almost of a human connection. So that was a bit of an issue. So just to sum up, um, this small study, again, it was just preliminary evidence, but I, we found it, in, it interesting because um, overall, we found that the clients, our participants, were very keen to learn. They wanted to learn, they wanted to, to try and use technology. They were not resistant. Um, and the therapists as well, they took on the challenge and they really tried their best. There was a major barrier, however, 
which was the lack of digital literacy um, and access uh, for clients. Um, so obviously there is a great need for service design, for guidance, for delivery of um, services that are equitable for different people uh, with dementia. Uh, for people with dementia who are at risk of, again, being disempowered by um, technology as opposed to getting the benefits of, of it. But also we found that sometimes there was an issue um, with the services as well. Lincolnshire was the only service that managed to, to really uh, realize this kind of uh, um, translation with, with a video conferencing uh, modality, but other services were not able because they were not ready, because there was less training, because maybe sometimes there was a bit of a resistance. So in terms of services, um, there's also some work in, in developing maybe a culture as well sometimes for this type of of technology. Um, travel, traveling long distances and traveling for a long time, sometimes um, where there are large catchment areas. For example, Lincolnshire is a very rural um, county. So um, a face um, um, a face to face rehabilitation is sometimes more time and resource intensive than tele rehabilitation. So we would like to again um, underline that this could be um, an energy, um, um, a resource, a resource saving kind of approach. But our participants and the therapists as well strongly agreed that face to face is still preferable, are still preferable, um, particularly when it comes to, um, to um, some um, uh, stages of rehabilitation, including the initial assessment, for example, progression, as I mentioned before, but also when you need to establish, build report and finish um, uh, report at the end of the involvement. So overall, um, it seems that this study suggests that video consultation are acceptable when social distancing is required, whether it's COVID or whether it's other situations where, again, the the client cannot be cannot uh, maybe uh, travel um, for um, rehabilitation or um, in any instance where there is a need, then video consultations seems to be acceptable and doable. But a hybrid approach probably would strike a better balance between both the patients and service needs. So I guess that's the take home message that we derived from our little experiment um so i guess that's it um thank you everybody for your attention i will unshare uh if i manage and um if you have any questions i'll be happy to answer them sal you've got a question you've got a raised hand that was applause uh oh, it wasn't oh. a raised hand but <laughs> simply appreciation yes let's give give claudio Thank you. Thanks a lot. I, I, in, 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 um, because of time, I'd like to limit uh, the numbers of questions now. Again, as we did with Lucy in the talks before, keep them on your sheet for the sandpits. If you want to ask them, you know, if you don't want to attend the sandpits, put them in the chat. Uh, I think it was a great talk, uh, Claudio. And again, sort of highlights this need for a personalized approach hybrid approaches, really um, looking at these difficulties in people living by themselves without mm. the support, with the cognitive impairment, with the challenging behaviors, perhaps people who, who don't really see the benefits of it, the people who perhaps need it most. W would you agree? Is that? Yeah, absolutely. And one thing you mentioned before is very crucial. Uh, crucial. I think it's about motivation, isn't it? Yeah. In terms of rehabilitation and physical, <laughs> physical activity, when you have people with dementia who <laughs> have apathy, there is a need for support to mm. motivate them to engage in the process. And we found, unfortunately, that especially through the phone, that motivation couldn't be developed. I mean, it was a peculiar situation anyway, because COVID brought everybody down in terms of you know being active, but it was so difficult not seeing the therapist in front of you, yeah. having a chat, having somebody who's there for you, and shows mm -hmm. that he has an interest in helping you out. 
in, so in terms of motivation, I think that there's a strong uh, need for us to keep this in mind and come up with ways in which, in which we can work this out. Certainly the video helped in some respects because you could see the person, yeah. but still, again, the face-to-face -face probably is the way to go unless we come up with really equitable ways of mm -hmm. being able to work with this population. Yeah, perhaps, I mean, there are new ways on, on Teams, aren't there now, where you can, you can work with people sort of with screens in a slightly better way. I mean, certainly better than light we have here yeah. <laughs> in, uh, in this room. But uh, no, that was great. It, it very much also tied in with, with things we heard earlier from, from physical activity for people with dementia, is that the, the person doing the exercises, the actual trainer is really important. And you mentioned that previous report that the therapist needs to have uh, preferably to, to make it a success, right? So it's, it's important yeah. to have that connection rather than to perhaps just see somebody on the screen. Yeah, and also quite interestingly, if um, some of the participants said that although the, the, the therapist was not at home, still seeing them uh, through the video, doing the exercises in, in uh, live with them, kind of kept that connection to an acceptable level. Right. Because Perfect. it felt like, you know, you were still somehow connected to the person. You were together making an effort to do exercise. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, we're a little bit over time and I've just been uh, texting with Martin. He has to, uh, he's got another appointment at four o'clock. I think some people might be bursting at the seams here and needing to go for a, a five minute comfort break. In the meantime, um, I can perhaps load the talk from Martin up. So we're ready to go. So let's take five no more than five and then uh, come back here at um, at uh, late um, 15:30 now it's 15 18 uh, to to start again if, if if you need to have a quick break or a quick drink or have some lunch in the back there's still lunch to be had uh, if you if you would like it um felicity did did martin send his talk have you got it loaded up well lots of ideas right so um uh, if i can Hi. i've got my talk up as well you oh, can you've got your talk so you can share brilliant thank I you martin. Share, yeah. that's super oh okay great felicity don't worry martin has got his talk so he can he can just share it um so uh it's great that you're you're willing to talk, Martin. I'm really sorry we're we're running a bit late. That's fine. Um, I some of the discussions I 